Hi everyone, this is Dave Koss, and uh, today I'm going to do an intro to Cinema 4D. Uh, if you are familiar with 3D, uh, 3D programs already, uh, then this will be pretty rudimentary for you, but um, I'm going to go ahead and do this for the people who haven't used this program before. Uh, when you first open it up, you'll notice there's two lines on each side. Um, usually you'll be working in HD so um, it starts off by default at 4x3 um, if you hold command B which sometimes I refer to command as Apple just because I'm old school like that um, so if you hit command B uh, you'll get your render settings and first thing we're gonna do is go to output now under output um, We'll go with HD TV 1080 2997. That'll kind of be our standard. And on anti aliasing, we're going to go ahead and put that to best, kind of as a default, almost every time. Um, so now we've got the program open. And you notice there's one big window here. And if you click this top right button, you'll get your four views perspective, top, right, and front, which you can change any way you want. Uh, this way you can see the different angles. Um, X, Y, and Z. Uh, you've also got um, a couple other buttons here. I don't really use these. These are for navigation. Um, but I'd say uh, just stick with this tutorial and learn the shortcuts instead because it's a lot faster. All right. Um, so just to get everybody familiar with the interface, we're going to go ahead and make a cube. And that's this right here. If you click and hold you get all your different shapes. If you um, just press the button you'll get a cube by default. Uh, you can also on any of these menus drag, uh, click and hold and then let go with your mouse on top of this window and it will kind of pop out those. So sometimes I like to use it if I'm, I'm working on a project that requires me to use a certain command a whole bunch of times but it's not something I want to have like up in my toolbar all the time. Um, I'll just pull something out like this to get the job done. So back to the cube. We'll go ahead and make a cube here. And to rotate around, I like to hold the Option key because I'm on a Mac. So I hold the Option key and I drag around. Now, if you have just installed Cinema for the first time, it's probably not set to Zoom to Object. I prefer Zoom to Object. Cinema 4D used to be that way by default and they changed it, I don't know why. Um, but I really prefer working this way uh, by going to your preferences and going to your uh, navigation. So I have camera mode here set to object because I like to rotate around the object. And, and if you have it off, if you have it, I believe uh, center is what it's at by default now, um, it rotates around the center rather than the object and I just honestly I don't understand why they didn't just leave it um, on object. With this cube if we want to zoom in and out um, we're going to use the uh, number two key. We're going to hold the number two key down and just drag and that lets us go in and out on an object. Uh, if we hold the number one key down that um, pans the camera and there's a difference between doing that and and, um, and actually moving the object. So if you're new to 3D, you'll notice that I'm moving this cube left and right right now by clicking on this arrow. It's not the same as holding down one because now the camera is moving, not the object. Um, to give you an example, I'll put something else in the scene. So now I've got a sphere. If I were to to move this cube, it moves past the sphere. And if I if I was to hold down the number one, I'm just moving the camera back and forth. The object isn't moving. So you've learned one to move, two to zoom in and out. Uh, three will rotate, but I prefer using option because I do a lot of rotating. Now, I've got these two objects in here. I can click on them in the viewport. I could click on them um, from a different viewport here from the top for example or I could click over in my object manager you can see sphere 
and cube that's the easiest way to do it and probably the best way because if you click in the viewport you can accidentally click and move something at the same time and down the line that can really screw up your animation so it's better to just click here in the object browser object manager all right now that we've learned uh, one two and um, option or one two and three we're going to learn about the different tools, such as the Move tool. E, R, and T are your best friends. E is Move, so you have your three axes here. R will rotate a cube. You can do kind of a free rotate if you click anywhere, or if you just want to go in one specific direction, you grab the ring. T uh, is for scaling or transform. You've also got um, the individual um, handles here. Um, one thing that I kind of got stuck in one time when I was new to Cinema 4D was um, if this X, Y, and Z are off, then your object won't scale the way you want it to. Or if you have you know, one of them on, it's only going to go in that one direction like that. Now if I turn on Y, it's only scaling on X and Y, and Z it does all three of them. On the left, uh, we have uh, some tools that are more for modeling. Um, let's go ahead and make a cube, or stick with the one you have, just make sure it's selected. You're going to hold down the C key. What that does is change this primitive into a polygon. Uh, that is kind of mixed down. The only good comparison I have is if you're using Illustrator, for example, but a lot of people won't know what that is. Uh, the difference between a vector image and a rasterized image. It's not quite the best analogy, but that's kind of the way, the way I explain it to people sometimes. Like if you have a cube, down here in your attributes, you actually have control over the size. Um, on XYZ, uh, how many segments. Um, if I turn on lines, you can see segments. All right, now, now that I have this cube, if I hit C, it's not editable anymore in that it's not a primitive. I could still go to its scale properties if I need to change the size in one direction or another, but it's kind of mixed down at this point. It's kind of point of no return. So sometimes if you're actually working on something and you think you might need to come back to it as a primitive before you mix it down make a copy of it copy and paste and then you can mix the new one down and uh, if you need to come back to that other one sometimes it's helpful to have it saved here I've segmented this um, now I don't see the grid up here this is a good time to bring up display options uh, you've got a few different types of shading and it depends on what you're doing what you're going to use sometimes you want to see lighting uh, sometimes you don't want to see lighting sometimes you want to see a quick shade or um, a better representation of what the render will look like as opposed to just being able to see the shapes this can really start to make sense when you start working with lighting um, if you if you are working with lighting you can see this side of the cube is lit up here this side isn't and that can um, be difficult to navigate, obviously, when it's all black. So I'm going to do a quick shade instead. And now we're not really showing all the lighting, per se. Um, also, you can add the, um, any display. You can add the shading with lines so that you can see what you got going on as far as your segments of your object. Um, to center up any object you have selected you hit S. You can probably see that I've been doing that a little bit here. It's really nice to kind of just orient yourself really quick. If you got a bunch of other objects lying around in your scene and it's a big mess like this, if you want to concentrate on one object like this one over here, how are you going to see what you're doing? Well rather than like zooming out and dragging over, zooming in, or if you don't realize you're not centered up, trying to center the object by using all these keys, you can just hit S and it centers you right up. So let's say I'm over here, I'm working on this object, 
and I want to go over back to that other plane you don't even have to see it in the viewport you could actually just uh, pick it in your object browser over here hit S and there it is centered up so with this cube I'm going to explain the sidebar items here finally um, this is the point select tool and you can see when you click that all the different points at these intersections on this cube come up and that's so you can select a point and move it individually you can do the same thing with lines and you can do the same thing with planes so there's a selection tool up here and one is live selection kinda of like a paintbrush and if you're in point mode right here and you just kind of shade you know or draw you can pick points that way you can see you can move them or rotate them or whatever you want to do with those shortcut keys I showed you earlier alright now um, your other selection tools up here are rectangle you can do a rectangle uh, select um, you've also got lasso so you can do kind of a freehand select you've got polygon and uh, to finalize the polygon you actually hold down uh, control that finishes the polygon it's something I always had trouble with all right um, there's some options on your selection mode for example if I were doing a rectangle mode here and um, I'm gonna select this front section of the cube well the back of it isn't selected and that is because there is an option called only select visible elements now if that's unchecked I do the same thing it's gonna select points that are on the back side of the cube see both sides it went all the way through there's also tolerance selection and let me show you what that is for this example we're going to use line mode line selection mode now I want to select only visible elements for this okay and um, I'm gonna do a selection tool over this one rectangle only well it's not selecting why is that it's because in order for it to select without this option tolerance selection you have to use the entire uh, you have to go over the entire rectangle so see now that I've selected all points and all, are all lines in the object it actually selects so right here right here right here it selects the whole thing anything that it's touching so if I kinda go like this I get some of the top ones in and it selects the whole thing if this were not on and I did that same thing those would not get selected uh, when you're using live selection also um, you can select like a paintbrush like I talked about earlier but you have radius down here in your attributes so you can do a, a, a bigger radius uh, to cover more area more quickly depending on your application if you're trying to be uh, very very careful with what you're selecting uh, you could do one for example and select one object now holding down shift while you select will add to your selection holding down command will subtract from the selection so say I'm building a Mario character or something I tried to make a nose that was a bad nose but if I hold down the shift key I can add that's a really terrible Mario now the same things apply um, with navigation when it even comes down to the um, polygon level if I'm working with just this one rectangle right here and I hit S it zooms in just like it would with a whole object as far as navigation and of course same thing applies to um, movement and rotation and everything else works the same way on the sub object level 
Um, I'm going to delete everything here in objects. And I'm going to make a box again. And I would like to change the pivot point. Um, let's turn this into a door for this example. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to click on our cube. And we are going to change the y-axis in size. And we're going to change the x. And we're going to make this kind of thin rectangle here. And just to make it interesting, um, let's add a cylinder. Down here, I'm going to change the orientation to negative Z. Nope, I lied. I'm going to change it to positive X. Now, I hit um, T, and then I'm going to drag down the cylinder. I'm going to hit E to move the cylinder over here. And that's going to be my doorknob, and this is going to be a door. And this is how we're going to learn about pivot points. Now, um, make sure you're in object selection mode, which is up here, or I'm sorry, model selection mode up here. We're going to select this door and move the pivot point or axis. It depends on what program you're using, what they call this. Some people call it anchor point in some programs. So. Uh, I want to move that anchor point. I'm going to click on this button right here. Enable axis modification. The shortcut is L because it looks like the um, X and Y axis. Now, if I move this arrow right here on my door, the whole thing moves. Well, why? You can't modify the axis on a primitive such as cube. So if you click on the cube, you hit the letter C, it mixes it down. That's what I like to call it anyway, mixing it down. Now you can move that point. And a door, a door when you are opening it does not open like this. It opens with the hinges right here on the right side. Uh, the other thing is that we want to make this cylinder move with this cube. So. The cube is going to be what we call a what we call a parent. The cylinder is going to be a child, and if you click and drag an object under until you get the little down arrow here in the object browser, any object under an object like this will do whatever the top object does. For example, if I rotate this door because it's a child object, it follows the door. When you um, click back on the cube and go into your uh, axis modification here you can move the pivot point now how do you know that it's in the right place well you gotta use your other viewports um, something might look like it's in the right place like I might move this right here now it looks like this is on the door looks like the the center of these three arrows right here is on the door but it's not if I rotate around you see it's behind the door so it's really important that you use your other views to line things up so for example I'm gonna magnify this right view here now this is dead on and so I know if I move my access to right here that from this view it's okay now it may look okay like this. It still looks the same, except your um, other view could show that on the um, y-axis right here, you're actually, I mean, on the x-axis right here, you're actually very far behind the door. So what do you do? You look at another view, such as the front view here. So that's aligned on the right view and this one looks pretty aligned. It's hard to tell. We're far away. So what do I do? I hit S. And I hold 2 and I zoom in. And I can get that pivot point really, really accurate. The further I zoom in, see how accurate I'm getting. I'm very, very zoomed in right now. 
So front view, it's aligned this way. Right view, it's aligned that way. Top view will automatically be in the right place if you did that right. And if we look at our perspective camera view now, we rotate around it, you can see that this is in the right spot. We turn off the axis modification and we rotate with R. Now it is turning the correct way. That is where the hinge would be on a door. Now if you want to get real technical, the hinge would actually be slightly off. So because the hinge would actually happen on the corner. So we'll do that to be technically accurate. And that's how the door would actually swing. Uh, we're going to add a light to this scene. So we're going to go to our four views so we can see everything that's going on. What I like to do a lot of times is I'll hit Command A to select everything and I'll hit S. And that will bring everything all together in the scene, um, front and center, as close as I can get. For example, if there's more pieces in this scene, let's say I have a cube over here and a uh, polygon over here. If I select all and hit S, it centers up the center point of those three objects so I can see all that's going on. So anything you have selected, uh, I'm going to click on the door, hit S again, and here we are. What I like to do with this, after I've hit uh, Command A for Select All, and I've hit S to center up all, is I like to do it again in every view. The way you do that is if your cursor is over a view, that's the one it's going to center on. So I'll just kind of go around like that, and everything's kind of centered up. Now, uh, when I add this light, you can see right here, I'm going to click and hold. I'm going to add a spotlight. Spotlight appears kind of off screen. I'm going to go ahead and hit S so I can center that light up and I can look at it. I want it to be shining on the door, so I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. Now, if you hold down shift after you start dragging your object, it'll lock it in at 10 degree um, increments. And I'm going to do 90. That's what makes it easy to square stuff up and turn stuff 90 degrees. And you can see I'm moving on Z here, shining my light at the door. Now that I'm working with light, I'm actually going to go change this back to, um, I don't know what shading. Gorad shading. I guess that's how you pronounce it. I've never said it actually. Never said it out loud. So you can see your light here has a cone. You can also set how far it goes. Um, these lights are infinite by default though, so you would have to set fall off if this one were to really make any difference. But what I do use this for is um, just to show where my light is going. For example, if I if I made a light like this and I was looking at my top view I got my door but I really don't know if the lights hitting it especially if it were like right here I'm like I don't know is this hitting it well if you drag that out you can see yeah it's hitting it alright so I'm going to click on my door and hit S we're gonna hit render which is command R um, there are the three R's there's Command R, there's the Shift R, and there's the Option R, and they all do different things. When you're ready to do your final render, you will do Shift R. When you are wanting to just render in your viewport only, you hit Command R. When you want to see a live updated version of your render, you hit Option R. And there it is. You can rotate around in your viewport, and as soon as you let go, it renders it out. Now there's a little arrow right here, and the further down it is, the lower res the render is. So when you get a complicated scene and you're putting a bunch of stuff in here and it takes a long time to render, you might just want to kind of 
have a quick render reference on something to line something up or to see how something's going to look. You don't have time to sit there and wait five minutes for something to render. You can use this for other stuff such as lighting. Um, I'm going to leave this up a little. We don't have a lot in our scene, so I can leave my render quality arrow up a little bit. Now I'm going to use my light and I'm going to drag. You can see the light by um, by default in uh, your viewport, but it will actually render it every time you let go. Now, this light and all other lights by default don't have shadows turned on. So I'm going to click on Shadow, Shadow Maps Soft. Now, there's kind of a shadow around my, my doorknob, but not really. First thing I would think is, well, maybe it's the angle. I'm going to take this light and I'll turn it this way. I'll hit render again. See, there's not a real good shadow going on here. And that's because my shadow map is only 250 by 250. If I take it up to 2000 by 2000, you see it makes a harsher shadow right here. I'll kind of click on this door, zoom in, hit render again. You can see what it does right there. You can see the extreme shadow, the more of an angle you have on your door. Now, what's cool is if you have a good enough video card, you can actually see this in real time. Um, I recommend not using enhanced OpenGL unless you really need it, because it'll slow things down. But um, if you click on Options and you turn on Enhanced OpenGL and you turn on Shadows, you will see a live shadow. Now, what's nice about this is if you're using shadows, you know, as a especially um, big piece of your animation and not, not as an afterthought, like if this were something dramatic and you wanted to make it look like the shadows were, were moving, you know, you'd want to be able to line that stuff up as you go you know, and not just hope that it works out or line it up and hit render, check it out, you know, move it again. You can see that right now, as I just move this across, the shadow is updating in real time, which is really nice. You can also use OpenGL to see other things um, like um, post effects and transparency. Um, I've never really used it for noises all right, so we've got our door, and um, we're going to make something to go with this, something pretty simple. Um, but we're going to build it out of a spline. Now, hopefully you're familiar with this type of thing from um, other types of art programs. Um, if you're not, I suggest you really learn how to use a Bezier tool. Because not understanding how to set points and how the curves work is just incredibly frustrating if you've never done it before. Um, personally, I, I, I think that um, it was really hard for me to build stuff until I learned how to use splines correctly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start on um, a right view here with this Bezier tool. And I'm not really going to make anything per se, just kind of um, ad lib here. See how the handles move. And if you hold down shift after you've clicked, you can take a handle and move it in the direction that you want your next line to go. That's one of the biggest things I didn't realize when I first was learning about splines. All right. I'm going to click back at the end to form a um, closed spline. And it's not really supposed to be anything. It's just kind of uh, we're teaching what extruding is. Now, 
right here uh, you've got a number of, of different tools uh, to, to help you start modeling stuff um, usually these are always a good start <clears throat> um, extrude is what we're going to use here we're going to take um, the extrude object that was created on the object browser here and put the spline under it as a child you can see what happens now we've extruded in the wrong direction we've extruded on the uh, z-axis so you can see we still have a a flat object here I'm gonna go back to my quick shading so I can see what I'm doing it's still flat it extruded it in the wrong direction so if you click on extrude nerves and um, you'll see there's there's movement here that's the direction it's extruding we don't want it to um, extrude on Z or the, the blue one here you can see we want it to go this way which is X X is always the red arrow um, so we're gonna change X to 20 and we're gonna change that Z to um, 0 this is this is X Y and Z and now we've got um, a correct extrusion only thing is you notice that the um, pivot points are not right you've got um, your spline that was right here but your pivot point or axis is, is is way over here so I'm gonna hit L or click on this um, enable access modification tool and I'm gonna slide it this way and now it's in the middle of my object where I want it. Problem is, if I click on the parent object, this extrude nerves, now it's off. So what do I do? How do I line them up? Because because turning this, it, that's not the middle of it. That's not where I want it to, to pivot. Well, the easiest way to do that is the center parent two object. You've got center two parent, where in that case, your spline would center up to where the extrude object was. But more often, I actually use the other way. I do center parent two. It takes the parent object, which is extrude nerves, centers it to the object you're on, in this case, the spline. Easiest way to get to this tool, easiest way to get to a lot of these kind of buried tools is to hit shift C. And it will say, enter your command. I want to center parent two. And you can see that's the first one that came up. I'm just gonna hit enter and it automatically did it. See now the pivot points axes are the same. So back to the extrude tool. Um, now notice if you hit S it actually centers in on your object. Um, before when the pivot point was over there it would have just centered up a little broader because the objects on the right and the pivots on the left it's it's more area that it has to cover uh, to center up. All right, um, with my extrude nerves selected, I'm gonna go ahead and name this. And I'm really actually pretty anal about naming things. Um, I am going to call this um, spline, not sline, spline, just to match the name of my spline. Now these have really hard edges, and if you hit render, command R, let me turn off my light for, for now so we just get default lighting. Okay, you can see the, the object here. Very hard edges. And if I, if I start zooming in, there are going to be kind of these segmented areas. It's not completely smooth, you'll notice. I render it you can see that's not completely smooth so most of the time you're gonna be way out here you're not gonna notice that and it's easier for the computer to calculate um, these objects uh, with less segments like this see this only has like four right here but if we were gonna do something where we zoomed way in um, close up on an object we would we would start to notice this so we we'll go to the spline itself and you'll see the angle set to five here Now you want to bring it down closer to zero so you get it where you want it 
Um, zero is fine for something like this, but if you have something really complicated, uh, it might start to bog your computer down. But notice now that we've got this smoother line right here on our polygon. Um, now what I'm going to do is uh, go to the tab labeled caps in your extrude object down here in the attributes and um, I want to change the start and end not to cap as it is but to fillet cap now I want to do it on both start and end so I'm gonna click start I'm gonna hold down command and hit end so I, whatever I do will happen to both of these then I hold down command while I select fillet caps so you're doing command twice. You're doing command to select start and end, and then you hold it down again before you click and, and change your setting, and it will change on both of them. It's just nice to have because you could do it at once. It saves you some time. Now notice that uh, initially uh, steps are set to one. Okay, If we want to do two, notice I'm doing the same thing here. I've locked these together by holding down command when I select them, and over here by holding command before I change the parameter. One step you can see there's only one bevel here. Change it to two. There's two steps in the bevel and so on. You know it just gets smoother and smoother. Um, I either like to stick with something uh, harsh like this or something fairly smooth which would usually be like a three. It really doesn't have to be up that much. Um, now the radius controls how big that bevel is. So you can see. If I want like a really fine bevel, I want it smooth, but I want it fine. Or if I want to get real small with it, I'll do like 0.3. You know, sometimes I like to have a really, really small but smooth bevel. Kind of gives it a nice little distinct line. Um, now you also get kind of a distinct line by doing one step thin like that, but it does look a little bit different. Um, you'll find out later on how to work that to your advantage, especially when it comes to text and uh, specular and reflection. All right, um, there's different uh, types uh, of caps that you can use, of fillet caps. Um, you've got convex by default. You've got concave. I actually like using half circle because half circle, I gotta make this a little bit bigger. I'm gonna do two steps and radius of one. Now let me get it the right angle so you can see what's going on here, but if I render that, we can see this section actually goes in. So you've got the bevel that comes up and then this comes in. Kind of like a sign would. Like a, not a neon sign, but just a backlit sign uh, would have a little border going on here. Kind of looks like a toucan. Close this project. I'm going to do a file new. And I'm immediately going to hit Command B. Like we did earlier, I'm going to use my default 2997-1080 and anti-aliasing best. Okay, now the next thing um, that's in this little area that we want to talk about would be uh, sweep nerves, which is fairly useful. Uh, we're going to create something very simple. We're going to um, choose a circle and we're going to do bezier and we're going to create our own bezier um, i'm going to go to the top view create our own kind of curvy spline here and it doesn't have to close it doesn't have to uh, come back around now so i've got this circle i got this spline what i want to do is wrap this circle around this spline I want the circle to be smaller. I'm going to scale it down a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm going to use the sweep nerves object. 
Now I'm going to say I want this circle. I'm going to make it a child object of uh, sweet nerves. This circle to go across this spline. You can see the order there. If you do it the other way, it's the opposite. You don't want that. You see, you say I want this circle to sweep this spline. If you remember saying it that way, uh, it'll be easier. All right, so it's gone around it. Same thing applies that we talked about earlier uh, when it comes to the um, the angle of a spline. Um, if this angle is all jacked up here, you can see what what happens. The circle comes along here, and then it's it's um, very abrupt. I guess is the term I'm looking for. If you bring this angle down every corner, instead of being very abrupt turn, very abrupt angle, it actually smooths out uh, the sections. This corner right here, if I bring it back up, you can see. Smooth it on out. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we can make stuff like hoses and pipes and stuff like that. And what's nice about this stain as kind of an editable object, per se, uh, would be uh, you can uh, select points individually and make changes without um, having to go back a bunch of steps. You know, if this were just um, one polygon, you wouldn't be able to um, attach it to, to something um, like if this were a pipe. Um, if, you, if you were off in your calculation and it didn't fit, if this was just a mixed down polygon, you wouldn't be able to um, really fix those minor details without putting in a lot of work. I'll show you the example. Um, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to mix it down as just a polygon. You don't have to remember how I'm doing this right now. But look at this. This is just a giant mess of points. If, um, if I realized, oh, this little piece over here needs to come out further, Boy, that's a lot of work to make all these little sections uh, even and, and make it look nice. You know, you'll you'll end up you know screwing it up. I could take all of these points and and move them, and then oh my gosh, it's just crazy. Now, keep it easy. Keep it as a uh, sweep nerves. Got to go back. Let's say we got to we're gonna make a cube. This is our it's our big power plant that we're building. And uh, I'm attaching this pipe. And I'm like, oh crap, that doesn't work. Doesn't doesn't reach. Go to my spline, go to my point edit tool so I can find that point. Now, you'll notice there are other points in here that are hard to find. You can go to your top view and find them. You know, some other view that isn't actually kind of, you know, um, halfway rendered out or halfway shaded. <clears throat> you can find them that way. The other way to do it is you could just turn off your sweep to find that point real quick if you want to use your perspective view. Or in your sweep nerve settings, and this applies to just about every object, click on sweep nerves, go to basic, and click x ray. That will help you as well, because now you can turn on your spline, you can see on the inside. I'm going to take this, I'm going to turn, you don't want to do your handles in perspective view, because you don't really know which direction you're going. I'm going to undo, I want this to all stay flat, and you can see what happens here. Now I can tell that that pipe is going up rather than down in the perspective view because on my right view right here I can really tell what's going on from that perfect side angle. Um, I'm going to rotate this. I'm going to turn it this way. Move it this way. Into my power plant box thingy. Now, if I turn the x-ray off, it's nice and attached. It all works. All right, so sweep nerves. I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn the, that off. Um, I've been doing this, but I didn't mention um, these, these checks right here and these, and these dots. We call them traffic lights. Um, you got... Uh, 
sweet herbs, check and X, you know, on or off, pretty simple, right? Well, then you got these, and they turn green, and they turn red, and then they're clear. What are these? Okay, well, I'll do it on the sweet herbs so you can see what's going on. The top one means editor. What is it in editor? Um, right now, your object, uh, this object, is clear. This button's clear. So you click on it once, it's green. It means it's on all the time, no matter what, in your editor. Click it again, red. It means it's off in your editor. The bottom one is for renderer. Is it defaulted to whatever its parent object is? by being clear? Is it green, uh, meaning it's on no matter what in the renderer? Or red, meaning off. Now here's how you would use these to your advantage. Um, sometimes you just need to turn stuff off uh, because y you need to see what you're doing. You need to render something out and see what you're doing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn everything off. And the way you can do that across the board is click and hold and drag. See, so I clicked and held and drag, and I did it again. So I don't see my sweep nerves here, and I hit render, and I don't see it here. So that's good. Maybe I'm working on this box, and I don't want to see it right now. Um, now, maybe I'm working on this box, and I need to be able to see what I'm doing around the box, but I still want to see it in the renderer because I still want to see my final project when I hit render. Well, the bottom buttons, turn them back to clear. I can still see what I'm doing in preview, but when I do this and hit render, which is command R, you can see that it's that it's there where I want it to be. Now, sometimes it could be the opposite. Um, I'm going to put everything on clear. Maybe this is a guide for something. Uh, maybe um, I don't want this in the final. I just want this to help me line other objects up. It's kind of a helper object. Um, I can turn it off in the renderer only for these three, and then it doesn't render. Now, the difference between a clear traffic light button and a green one, let's find out what that is. I'm gonna put the sweep object under my cube. So my cube is the parent object here. You can see it's all attached, okay? Now, I may wanna turn off this cube in my editor because I'm working on something. If I double click, so I have the red traffic light button on the top, everything under it disappears, which may be what I want. But there are a few occasions where uh, your, some of your sub pieces you don't want to disappear. Let's say you have a hundred things under this cube and you only want you know half of them to be there. You can it's essentially an override uh, by turning that piece green because now that green light on editor means no matter what's happening up here on the parent object as far as visibility, this will always be seen. Now if I hit render, uh, for example and you know, I'm, I'm red on editor and on renderer on the cube. You can see that my other object is off. If I have the override green on, it renders no matter what. And, of course, it's from earlier, it's in the viewport no matter what, in the editor, no matter what. Hope that made sense. Um, now, let's look at uh, lathe. That's a fun one. I'm going to delete what I was working on earlier. I put a lathe object right here. Lathe, however you say it. And I'm going to um, also use the Bezier tool. I'm going to go back to um, my right view here. And I'm going to make a, a vase, which is the classic lathe object. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom. Now, if you're not real good at this yet, don't worry about it. Just do something close to what I'm doing. I'm not even being accurate right now. This is just an example 
to show you what this can do. What I'm doing is I'm making a cross, a half of a cross section of my, my vase. So um, you imagine you're looking at the object from the side. It would be this whole area here. And I'm only doing the half of it. Because what I'm going to do with this lathe object is I'm going to wrap it around an axis, a Y axis. So by making this spline a child of the lathe object, you see it just took that cross section, it wrapped it all the way around. See what it did here. Very, very, very crude model, but uh, you get the picture. And you can see where I did the, the little where I came back around on the top and I made the lip and I came back in, it gave me an opening. Same things apply here uh, as far as moving uh, points after the fact. It's, uh, it's nice to be able to come back and do that. If you don't like something or if you want to change something, notice how segmented this is. See all the segments. If you want that to come out smooth, um, you come back into your... Uh, your subdivisions jacking up the subdivisions it's still sec it's still uh, choppy around this way I'll crank that one up here see nice and smooth um, also, you've got angle again. Um, you'll notice if your angle's up too high, what it will do to something like this. Of course, you use that to your advantage. You might want something cool looking like this. All segmenty. Looks like a lamp. I love lamp. Let's start fresh. And let's do a cube. I rotate around this cube. Another good shortcut is duplicating. Uh, I want to move and duplicate, so I hold down Command. Now I got two boxes. Select all S. Oops. Select all, hit S. You can see them both. It's real nice. I'll click. I'm going to make one smaller than the other. Okay. On the Z axis, I'm going to move this kind of inside the other box. Now I want to cut out that cube from that cube, which I also call a box. Same thing. Um, I'm going to create a bool. I'm going to say I want to subtract the small box from the big box. Now, this is where it gets kind of confusing, uh, which one goes on top here. I'm going to say I have the big box under the bowl, big cube. I'm going to say take this and subtract this. So big cube on top, little cube on bottom subtracts what's left. Now, if I, if I switch them, you see what happens. You only get... You get the large one just chopping this box in half, and half of it's gone. It's not what we want. We want this. You've got different options for your Boolean type down here. If I do um, A union B, it's a union. Subtract is what we were on, A subtract B. A intersect B, and A without B. So... The, the two most common ones you will use are A without B and A subtract B because A subtract B lets you take that small piece and fine tune, you know, an, an actual cutout and, and it forms these inner walls. Those inner walls aren't there until you do that subtraction. Usually the, the cube here would be hollow. That's your other bool option. You can say A 
without B, now you can see that those walls inside, those, those sides were not formed. So it's just slicing it basically out of this one side and then showing you the, the hollow cube that's left afterwards. So both of those would be useful in different situations. Now, when you do a very difficult uh, bool with a bunch of stuff in it and it's all complicated, this, this viewer is going to get so bogged down. And, and I recommend if you're going to use a bool, first of all, only use it when you have to, if there's no other way to create an object. Second of all, when you're done, click on the bool and hit C. Now, what that's going to do is mix down what you got. Um, so you may want to make a copy before you do that. Now it's mixed it down into two different objects. I'm going to select both of them. I'm going to go to objects. I'm going to say connect objects and delete. I'm just mixing this down, moving it to the top. I'm going to delete this null. This is a mixed down object now. And once you do that, your computer is going to really handle this object a lot better. Now before we move on, I'm going to show you what a null object is. And there's two ways to create a null object. If you just want a brand new by itself null object, you go to create object null. Okay? There's a null. It isn't anything. It's nothing. But it can be, it can be used to group things. It can be used uh, for parenting things. Um, I'm going to take this cube. I'm going to hit copy, which is command C. Then I'm going to hit command V a bunch of times. Okay, so now I have six cubes, and they're all just kind of out here, and I'm going to start grabbing them, moving them, different places, cubes everywhere, select all, you can see. Now, if I want to control these, or group these, I'm going to need a null. I could take all of these, select them one by one, and then drag them as a child of the null. But then an easier way to do it, I'm going to delete this original null. The easier way to do it is select what you want, hit Alt G, boom. Collapses it and everything. Everything you need's in here. So we can name it now. We can call it cubes. The other thing you can do besides just using this for grouping is to do um, um, control uh, rotation and, and, and movement and stuff like that as a separate entity. For example, um, I'm going to take cube number two. I'm going to go to this down here. This is my timeline. I'm going to drag my timeline to zero. I'm going to hit a keyframe. Keyframe being this is, this is um, a point that I want this object to be at this number of frames at zero frames. We want this to be in this position. I'm going to go out to 90 frames. I'm going to rotate my object in any direction I want. I'm going to hit keyframe again, meaning I want it to be at this point at 90 frames. And the computer figures out the rest. There you go. The in-betweens. Okay. And you can do it with other, other objects too. Keyframe it. In this case, I'm going to move it to frame 90 and keyframe again. You see? There we go. And then this one I'm going to make shrink. Now there's a difference here. You need to be in object mode to keyframe scale. So I'm going to, I'm in object mode up here. I'm going to scale. I, I hit um, my initial keyframe at zero. I'm going to go to 90 and hit T here. I'm going to scale down. That's where I want it to be at 90. Hit keyframe. Okay. There we go. Now, back to the null. Cubes. Null at the top. You can move this as a group. Let's say that I'm halfway through my animation. I'm at 45 frames. I want to move the entire group of moving objects. I'm moving the null, which contains everything on the inside. You can also animate the group. So I've got cubes selected, the null for cubes selected, keyframe at zero and at 90. I'm going to move the whole thing and I'm going to make it go down. Okay, Keyframe that. 
So the original things going on inside of that null remain the same. The scaling, the rotating, the moving up and down on the y-axis. But at the same time, you get this, this double motion here. And that works a lot better than doing these individually. If you were trying to move all of these with each other individually, it would be near impossible um, unless you had a null object. All right, new project. We're going to start again. And while we're here, I'm going to show you how to save this setting. I'm going to do 2997. I'm going to um, go to anti-aliasing options and set it to best. I'm going to go one by one and just show you some of this other stuff. Resolution for TV is always 72. Our aspect 16 by 9. Right now, our frame range of what we want to render when we do our final render, we're going to put on all frames so that when we do hit render, it renders our entire animation. We got this pretty much set. Um, we'll go over some of these other options later. Uh, I'm going to go to this render setting dialog down here and I'm going to save this preset. I'm going to save as Dave. Okay. Now when I come back I can actually click on Dave. I've got some other settings in here too already. But when you're coming and doing new projects and you're getting this 4 by 3 thing right here and you don't have your aliasing set right or any of that you don't want to have to set this every single time especially if you're doing this over and over and over go to render settings and, and get that saved in there and then that little tick button right there next to it the little target looking button will load that setting and there we go All right, so let's learn about modifiers. I've got a cube and um, I want to put a modifier on it. Um, well, there's a couple things that you need to know before you begin using the modifier. Number one, if you're bending an object, it needs to have a good number of segments in it. Why is that? Well, let me show you. I'm going to do a cube with only two segments in each direction and I want to put a bend on this now in my filters everybody has filters you can turn on and off things that you see in your viewport for example I don't like to have deformers on because if I have a lot of them it gets messy now I want to this this is the bend okay I, I turned on my deformers. Yours is probably on by default. You probably also have grid on by default. You can turn off your grid. You can turn off your deformer. Anything that's getting in your way, you can filter out in your viewport. It doesn't turn it off in the render. So my deformer's on. It's this blue box around my box that I made. They were both uh, created at origin, so it's nice and, and centered up right now. Um, bend. I'm going to turn the strength up on the bend. No, nothing's happening. Well, why is that? Well, that is because I um, haven't dragged the bend under my cube. Now, this is why your segments need to be high. I've got a really nice little bend going here, except it's not really bending the right way. Why is that? Segments aren't up. Start jacking up the segments here. Don't really need to do them here, but whatever. Render it out. Nice curve. Now, notice the way that it's bending. I go to my bend. My strength. See how much I can have it come back around. The circle. You've got... This is limited. Uh, if, it, if you do within box, you only bend within the blue um, outer box here. Now, you don't see a difference right now because I don't have it set up for that, but I'm going to take the bend and I'm going to make it so it's only like half this box. Notice, it's a bad example. <laughs> Let me move it to the top. 
notice that the bend only happens within that um, modifier or deformer. I'm also slightly familiar with max, so I get those two terms confused. So that's kind of fun. Only when it, when it is within the box does it change. Other option, unlimited. That means I could take this over here. Now turning it definitely does stuff, but I could take the box. over here and now it's it's still bending over here it doesn't have to be around it and actually if you play with stuff like this you can get some really cool looking stuff I don't know what I use it for but that's pretty cool looking this this is really something that you gotta play around with there's there's so many of these um, and they all do so many different things it's it's fun to do um, you probably won't use them that much honestly but when you do it's good to know uh, what you're looking for so you should I definitely recommend sitting around and playing with those all right <clears throat> extras that we have in here um, floor is a good example a floor looks like this okay um, a plane looks like this you're gonna say okay what's the difference well if I render this plane that's pretty much it so if I want it to be like a massive epic field I've scaled it up I'll render it it's really far away but it's not infinitely far away it's not like the ground, it's not like on the earth where it just keeps going. If you use a floor, it looks the same here. But when you render, it goes all the way out to your horizon. See that line right there? That's it. It goes all the way out infinitely. So we're looking down at it. So it fills the entire screen. All right, um, we've also got a background object here. That's especially good if you want to um, reference something, if you want to put a picture in the background uh, that you can um, reference for like modeling an object or lining up a logo or something like that <clears throat> um, to like extrude a logo based on a, a reference image you have of something. Um, what you do with the background object is you create a texture and you put it on that background. And we'll get to textures here in a little bit. So let's talk about lights. Uh, I'm going to create um, a floor object. So it goes on forever. I'm going to create a cube and I'm going to create a sphere and I'm just gonna move them next to each other move them up if I can figure out how to do that <laughs> there we go alright so they're sitting on this floor pretty much but it's flat there's no lighting okay we're going to use a spotlight we're not going to use this basic light that's the <clears throat> big mistake that a lot of people use they use these omni lights and they put these omni lights all over the damn place well you know what first of all that's bad lighting you don't just hang light bulbs everywhere when you're doing photo shoot you have targeted spotlights in certain places and you you have fill lights key lights and backlights and background lights and and you've got to think about lighting in 3d the same way you do with lighting an actual uh, scene in real life um, the other thing about Omni lights is um, they're going in all directions. 
which if you think of it in terms of a cube, it, sides of a cube, it's going out on in, in every direction. So if this was a light, it's shining out this way and that way and up and down and this way. And that's six different beams, basically, as opposed to a spotlight, which has the one beam. And that's going to up render times. So I put a um, spotlight in my scene to start. And this is basically how I always set up lighting. There, there are so many scenes that I've seen where people have set up just ridiculous amounts of light. And it, and it doesn't matter. Especially in simple scenes or logos, you don't need all of that. So I'm going to start with... Um, this is going to be my key light. It's going to be slightly above center, slightly to the right on my front view. You can see the same thing on top. It's slightly to the right, but I want to angle it down just a little bit. I also don't want it to be this straight on. I'm, I'm going to adjust this. I'm going, to, I'm going to turn it this way. I'm going to move this direction. So you see what I'm doing here. I'm getting this all, all set up for a key light. Now my fill light is going to have pretty much the same settings. What I'm going to do, just like duplicating an object in the viewport, I'm going to hold down command and I'm going to click and drag this light. Now I got two lights. So if I move it, you can see that's the second one. I'm going to move it far out. Not real far, but further. I'm going to turn it and aim it. So see, this is, this is going over here as well. And this is my broader further light. Now neither of them are casting shadows. And here's the thing. You only want to cast shadows on one light. Unless you really have to do it for specific artistic purpose or whatever. So my first light, I'm going to name this key. You really have to get in the habit of, of naming everything. Um, and this is fill. My key light is going to be the only one with shadows. So I click the shadow tab my attributes and I um, go to shadows shadow maps turn them on um, I'm gonna do 2000 by 2000 now, I can't see it here uh, my OpenGL like I talked about earlier has to have shadows on it's gonna sit here and think about it for a second and now you can see them I'm gonna adjust those shadows kinda get them where I want there we go. Hit render. You can see my key and my fill. Now, click on the box. Go in there. Hit S. I want beveled edges on this box. So I'm going to I'm going to click uh, fill it. Now I don't want that much of a bevel. I want a very fine bevel like we were looking at before. See how it makes it nice and smooth on the edge I also want a specular light and this is specular only I'm going to create another spotlight and I'm gonna make it come from the top I don't actually want 90 degrees. I want 80 degrees. So I'm going to I'm going to bring this back 10 degrees. This is going to be called my specular light. I name it spec. And under spec, I'm going to tell this to only um what am I looking for? I'm going to tell this to only uh, do specular, no diffuse. So this isn't actually lighting anything. This is only creating specular. Now this is all well and good, except we don't have a material that would really show off any sort of specular right now. That's where textures come in. Double click down here, your materials. We have a very flat, basic texture. I'm going to go ahead and drag this onto my cube. Um, in this case, because it's very straightforward, you can do that. Um, when your scene is complicated, don't drag like that. Drag straight to your object 
in your object browser. Makes more sense, works better. Um, you can also replace that way, um, which is nice. So if I had like a blue texture, I replace this texture and it retains all the um, attributes, UVW attributes. So in my white material that I've dragged onto my box, um, I'm going to make this a, uh, let's say, blue box. Now we got an actual material, and if we hit render, we can see eh, it's blue, it's whatever. Um, what we also want to do is work on specular. So I'm going to go to this specular tab, go down here. Um, I like to refer to these as low and flat or high and pointy. Um, specular is this little dot, basically, that you see on here. It's the light picking up on the material in different ways. See, if I do thin and pointy, you can see that's actually, this is real time because of this OpenGL, real time specular that you can see on this object. If I render it, you can see what it looks like. Now notice, because it's high and pointy, see the, the bevel is picking up that specular now. And this is where, if, if you learn this stuff, you can really start to fine tune your animations and make things look really pretty. Um, you can fine tune by holding um, Option R, like I was talking about earlier so that you kind of got a, a real-time update going here. And then you can go back down your specular. You can make it wider, you know, more. You can see what, what wide and flat does. It makes it real washed out. So if you got a washed out looking object after you've lit it, that's probably what you got going on is too wide of a specular. So I got that specular going. And um, let's say I want a little more um, radius to to pick up that specular a little more. I'm going to change this to three centimeters. See, so we got a nice look right there. On my lighting setup, the lighting's good, but I want to, um, I want to highlight this specular a little more. I'm going to click on my specular light. I'm going to jack the intensity up. Now remember, we've turned off diffuse. If diffuse was on, there'd be a lot more light here, but we don't want that. We're using this light just to, to catch these these bevels. And um, so since diffuse is off, I can really jack up this intensity and see what it's doing right here. Now that's probably too much, but you know, you do 200 and you get a nice little pickup here. You know, you take it down to nothing. You can see, see the top, there's nothing there. Jack that up and you start to get some really good edges really shiny looking edges. The other thing I'm going to do is under basic uh, tab in my material, I'm going to go to uh, reflection and I'm going to turn it on. Now by default, it gives me 100% reflection. In other words, this is now a mirror. So you can see right here, it, it's it's picking up the, the sphere and its reflection fully. Um, I'm going to bring this down to 30. Now, your amount of, of reflection will vary based on color. So, for example, I've got um, 30 on this right now. If I were to go to black, notice the reflection down here. If I were to go to white, you don't really see anything. It's because the brighter you get, the higher your reflection has to go up before you see something. So see, i got to jack this up a lot if I want to see that reflection in there for white. The other thing uh, that you'll come across if I bring this all the way back up is blurriness. Now blurriness um, can take a lot of render time. Uh, if I just do one for blurriness, you see how this goes up. I'm going to turn up this arrow so we can watch this in real time. Now not much blurriness here but it quickly goes up. I'm going to do five. You can see what that does. 10, 
Render time is really going to start going up, but notice it's a little grainy because that has to do with your samples. Once you really get the blurriness up there, you got to up your samples for it to look uh, the quality that you, that you expect from a blurred ref reflection. I'm going to do 20. Thing is, this would take a really long time to render. So unless you really have to do this, I would not recommend it, or I would find shortcuts. Uh, for example, um, if something is not in the scene and it's being reflected, like a blurry reflection of maybe an environment, blur the environment in Photoshop and then come back uh, in, in here and use that as the map rather than blurring all your, your textures because your calculation has been done already. Your, your blur has been done in Photoshop one time, not per object every single frame. So now that I got this blur way up, I'm going to bring this down. I'm going to do five and one sample. It doesn't have to be good because this is going to be, this reflection is going to be lowered. I'm going to do 20, but I'm also going to do blue so we can get away with uh, lower brightness in the reflection. I changed the wrong one. Color, blue, reflection, 20. There we go. 30 is usually a good area for like um, blue and red, possibly green. Let me bring up the red. You can see that's ah, a little too bright on the red. Let's see? Just a nice little afterthought of a reflection. We don't want that much. Now, I'm going to do another material. I want a black floor with reflections and blurry reflections. So I'm going to drag this material onto the floor. I'm going to turn on my interactive render region. That's cool. It's a nice looking table or whatever, but you know I want it to have that, that glossy, clean look. So I want a black table. And I want reflection. That's like a mirror. That's not exactly what I want. Um, the light is creating a really big specular um, circle right here. So I'm going to go to my specular and I'm going to make it thinner. I like that, that clean look, like it's sitting on a mirror. But I don't want it to be that bright. Um, on the reflection, so I'm going to bring the brightness down on the reflection. That's looking pretty good. I um, also want it to be blurred a little. I'm going to try a four. Yeah, nice little blur there. Lastly, I'm going to talk about cameras. Um, cameras need to be uh, dealt with Cameras need to be one of two things, um, a regular camera or a targeted camera. I really don't like targeted cameras because you can usually do what you want with a regular camera. So if you click on camera, your camera appears at, at, at the place you were, your camera appears where you are already as a camera. So like whatever you're looking at, that's the camera where the camera is placed. Um, if I were to zoom out right now and move around, I see my camera. There we go. So I zoom out and that camera is right where I was looking before I came from where that camera is. That's because when you create a camera, it's placed right there. Um, if I want to see what this camera is seeing, I actually click this little target button next to the camera and it takes me to what that camera sees. Now, let's say I'm setting up a camera shot. Okay. I, I'm on my camera. My camera is active. So this is my camera and I'm setting it up where I want it for the scene. Okay. If I go off of this camera, I can see my camera, I can see where it's set up, I can manipulate other objects. But if I click back on the camera, and then I decide to go manipulate an object, you know, way off field somewhere over here, 
all of a sudden I've moved my camera and I can't get that position back. Um, it's, it's, it's moved. It's not keyframe. So I don't know where it was. You can't really undo, uh, moving a camera. Uh, there's a special command key for that. But, um, what I prefer to do is lock in my camera. I get my view. I'm on my camera. My camera is selected and I hit a keyframe. What does that do? Well, if I decide I want to manipulate this object and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to make it bigger and do this. Oh, wait. I moved. My camera's moved too. In fact, if I click off of this camera, I can see that my camera's moved over here. Well, I didn't want to do that. The nice thing about the fact that this camera has a keyframe already is that as soon as you move on the timeline and move back, it's going to snap right back where it's supposed to be. So you don't have to worry about it. So set up your camera, keyframe it, and then just use it for reference until later on uh, when you decide to do all your camera animation. What I like to do is, you know, set a camera as I call it my start point, and then I'll duplicate it. I'm going to call this my end point. I'm going to go to it. I'm going to say, well, I want to end over on this side of this, this sphere. Click back on my, my end camera before I hit the keyframe. You got to remember that. You don't want to keyframe the object you were rotating around. Click on end camera, hit keyframe. Okay, so I got, I got two cameras. If I'm just looking at a regular perspective view, I got the end over there and the beginning over here. So I can go build out the rest of the scene. I can go build my sphere. I can move all this stuff around. And I want to go back to that start. Yep, that still looks right. I want to go to the end. Yep, that still looks right. All right, I've got those two. What's great is now in this version of Cinema, um, you can morph those points so instead of keyframing your camera and trying to get the, the look right, you can just morph these. Um, I'm going to go filter and I'm going to turn off lights because I don't want to see my lights right now. It's just confusing. Two camera points. Select them both. You hold down shift or you could hold down command. I have got camera morph. Camera morph. There we go. So, um, under camera morph, if uh, on this tag, this little tag right here, you got camera one, camera two, start and end. Okay, I actually want to want to flip those. I'm going to say I want start to be camera one and end to be camera two. You just drag them in there. All right, and I'm going to do a simple morph. Okay, now on this morph camera, you click the little target button so that you can see what you're doing. So now you are looking at that morphed camera. Well, it's not doing anything because you have to drag out the blend between the two cameras. It's, but it's going from camera one to camera two. And it's real simple because now you can keyframe this blend and you can go get those setups that you wanted perfectly framed the way you wanted with a a perfectly um, subdivided blend you know if you were to keyframe one point to the other you might have um, other issues that you run into like uh, the angles of the bezier that the the camera is on when it when it curves around and and um, you know un, uneven points on the spline that the camera is moving on. It's, this is just a really nice smooth way to get the job done. And you can do more than one camera if you want, which is nice. It also um, in, interprets all the other parts of the camera. So for example, um, if we go to this end camera and we change our focal length like this, we go back to this morph camera now, oops, into that tag actually morphing 
your focal length as well. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, there's other things I'd like to get into, like tags. Um, but I think this is a, a good starting point. Hope you got something out of this, and uh, until next time, thanks for watching.